Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to our weekly recap video. I'm gonna answer questions from last week's videos. Obviously, you are watching this on our Highlights channel and we've just decided to move the recap video to this channel just for now. Um, one, because it's kind of just the highlights of the week. That's what we're talking through in this video. So it kind of makes sense. And we've also got so many things going on and so many projects and so many videos backing uphill that I really didn't wanna take up one day with a recap video when I could post an actual project video on our main channel. So we're just gonna do this for now. Um, we might also be retooling this video a little bit because I feel like I'm answering the same questions or a lot of the same questions over and over again. And maybe that's okay. I know we're gaining a lot of new subs. Um, like last month, I think on our main channel, we gained what, 70,000 subs. Uh, which is crazy, a lot of new faces, and I'm just so thankful for it. And so maybe hearing those answers is helpful um, because we've got new people coming in all the time. Or I might just pare down the amount of questions I'm, I'm answering and maybe go into more depth into some of them. So I don't know, you might see it change a little bit. You might not, who knows. Anyway, let's just jump right into last week's videos. Uh, first one was deconstructing a perennial container. So I had the two containers up front that were full of hookahs, and I planted those out in March. I think it was early March. Can't remember now, late February. Anyway, they were gorgeous. And I talked about in that video how I like to reuse perennials from containers in my landscape. And if I could plant it that way and get double use out of my plants, I love that. Um, but I don't often show the deconstructing process and planting out, and that's what the video was about. So anyway, Pam said, it doesn't appear that you've used landscape fabric. How do you keep weeds from growing in your landscape? The weeds do grow in our landscape. We do a lot of hand pulling and we have everything very organized um, and zoned to where like every area of our garden gets looked at and weeded at least one time of week one time every week, and that way it never gets really out of hand. We do spray uh, Bonides Burnout on our gravel areas, and we've done a video about that before. We'll link it down below. There's no way we could hand pull weeds that come up in all of our gravel areas, because we've got quite a lot. And now with the addition of the new property and like bindweed over there is pretty bad, um, Burnout has been working really well. So anyway. Link for that video will be down below. Lee said, how do others handle the fact that the hookers get a tall, ugly stalk over the years? I find that the new leaves come up from higher up on the stalk and they no longer are so close to the ground. Do you dig and plant lower or cut the stalk off and the plant produces more leaves from the stub? You could do either of those things. So hookers tend to do that with age and some varieties will do it worse than others. And there's one of three things you can try, all of which carry a little bit of risk, but you could dig the entire hookera up and bury it deeper um, to where you're covering up the bulk of that stock with more soil. You can leave your plant right in its place and just mound more soil up over that stock um, to where it has a chance maybe to root into that soil. That is a little harder, especially if you're overhead watering because some of that dirt can slough off or slough away. So you have to keep your eye on it. And the other thing you, you can do is cut the stock off a kind, like real close to ground level and a lot of times they'll flush back new growth. I think that's probably the riskiest. I've done it though. Um, I've done pretty much all three. No, I haven't done the one where you mulch up or uh, mound up over the stock. Typically I'll bury them deeper or cut them off um, and that will get rid of the stock. Seabooth says, love the shovel you're using. It's just a really good size. Could you share the name or brand? So that one in the video was a radius shovel. The company sent that shovel out to us like right in the very beginning stages of our channel, which was just, it was so fun. And it is my favorite shovel. It is the perfect size for one gallon up to like three gallon size cans. We'll link it down below. Another one you can use, which I have and have used a lot is the Fiskar shovel. It's one that is half size as well, but you can extend it out and make it longer if you want. The blade size or the shovel size at the bottom is a little bit wider. Um, so it makes it a little bit more versatile for bigger plantings. And we'll link the Fiskars ones, one too, because they both work. Uh, Deanne said, thanks to you, Laura, I now have a couple hookers in my yard and I love them. Is it necessary to cut off the blooms? It's not necessary, you don't have to do it. But once they're done and the blooms are spent, it looks better and uh, cleaner to have them cut off. Carol says, I see a little post at the corner of the garden. Is that used to prevent the garden hose from mowing over your plants? Yes. I just went down to the garden center. They got a really cute load of, they're called hose guides. Um, and I kind of strategically place those around. They're really neat looking too. So they're kind of like, a, they're an enhancement, I guess, to the edge of a bed. They look really pretty, but they also keep my hoses from raking through all my plants. Emma said, what was that at the beginning of the 10 minute mark that you dug up and why? And that question happened a lot. And I 
can't believe I forgot to even talk about it. So right at the edge of my bed where I planted those wild, you can see them right now, the wild rose sucra, I had planted a nine bark and I did it right before our tour last year because I needed something red in that bed and it was totally improperly placed, but I needed it to look good for the tour. <laughs> so I put it right there, it looked beautiful, and then I knew I needed to dig it up and get it out somewhere where it could actually grow to its full size and not be right at the edge of the border. Um, so I took that, repotted it, and it's back at our greenhouse, and I'm just waiting for a spot, probably on the new property to plant it. There's always something I forget, like something important I forget in a video. That's why it's good to do these recaps, because then I can explain myself. Uh, Denise said, what is that hose no nozzle you use? It is a dram water wand. Vicki said, your soil always looks so beautiful and rich. What state are you in and did you amend the soil on your property? So we are in Eastern Oregon. Our soil is relatively free of rocks. So I'll give you that. Um, it is clay, but not super heavy clay, but it's very high pH. Um, we haven't like done an overall soil amending, but we do like a lot of, when I prepare a flower bed, I'll add in compost and I'll add in uh, like the Biotone starter fertilizer into a whole area and kind of work that into the soil. And I do that as much as possible. We are gonna be doing, we're looking into a much bigger scale of soil amending on our new property because it's so open. So Aaron's gonna get with our local um, farmer supply co-op and I think we're gonna have a bunch of gypsum brought in and some other things to help condition our soil and make it ready for planting. That's why like this year, I have no idea what's gonna happen in our cut flower garden because we didn't, we weren't really planting ahead good enough. So I'm gonna just individually amend with compost the areas I'm planting and hope for the best. A stitch, stamp, so repeat said, speaking of plant damage, several but not all of my hostas were damaged by the frost we recently had. Should I try to remove the damaged leaves or just leave them and see what happens? I would remove the damaged leaves. If you are past the point of having any other freezing temperatures, which I hope you are at this point, um, definitely remove those and let it flush back. We had kind of the same issue with our hostas a little bit. We had a hailstorm come through last year and just damage, just shred our hosta leaves. I talked about it a lot because it was traumatic for me, but we ended up going in and some of the hostas I cut completely off and it did take a long time for them to recover, but it was better than looking at damaged shredded leaves. Next video was getting a few projects done and I did try to remember because it seems like a while ago that I did this video. So I planted a bunch of stuff in flower beds like ridiculous coleus and strawberries, gomfrina. Um, I planted up the urns on the west side and I also did like some drip irrigation, mending and things like that. Uh, Rebecca said, I know this is off topic, but I was wondering if you and Aaron were still planning on attending the Grand Garden Show this summer. Um, the main reason my husband and I bought tickets was to see a meet you, which is just so sweet. Uh, you know what, at this point, all the plans are still set. I haven't heard any news um, yet. We will let you know though, as soon as we know anything, we will make some sort of an, annou an announcement. Uh, Glenn said, what if you used pine berries, the white strawberry in the moon garden for Benjamin? And I just love that suggestion. I think that's a great one because Benjamin loves strawberries. <laughs> and I think anything I can add like that will just in enhance his interest, I guess, in gardening and being out here. Um, he spent so long, like the entire time I was watering the greenhouse, which it takes me like 30 minutes to do that, I could see him sitting in the vegetable garden and he was picking off all the strawberries and he also likes to eat the green ones, which I'm trying to discourage, but um, hey, if it gets him out in the garden, I'm good with it. So pine berries would be a really fun option over there. April said, I'm loving the way that your moon garden is coming along. Could you please share the name of the white delphinium with us? I cannot find it on the Proven Winners website. Well, Proven Winners doesn't have any delphiniums currently, which they should, but I think the reason why they don't is because the only thing, the only plants that really make it into the Proven Winners lines, line is because they offer something like amazing within that category or within that variety. So it need to be a delphinium that like bloomed way longer or bloomed more often or wasn't prone to flopping over when they got huge. So it need to have like one of those characteristics to make it. But the one I have, it's called Guardian White. And I still plant a bunch of them because I love them. Uh, so do you mulch before you plant? Uh, sometimes I do, especially if I'm planting a bunch of annuals in an area. It is such a pain to come in with mulch after the fact and try to like work it around all the plants without getting mulch on all over the plants. So if I can mulch a whole area and then just scoot the mulch out of the way of the hole I need to dig, I would much prefer to do it that way. 
it's way easier for me. Megan says, how much is your water bill each month? Well, I would hate to know what it would be if we were connected to city water, but we are thankfully on a well. John said, you do a lot of planting, but do you run soil samples to find out if your soil is not suitable to the plants that are not doing well? You know, the only soil testing I've done here is I have a digital pH meter that you can stick in the soil and it'll give you a reading of what pH you have. And I don't know how accurate it is. I think it'll probably get you close, um, but we've never done an actual soil test. And what was the company's name, Erin, that just sent out? There's a company, Erin's gonna look up the name, that just sent us out a soil testing kit. So I think this is really cool. We'll probably do a video on it. I haven't even opened the box yet. But they send you the kit, you go out into your garden and you get soil samples and you put it all together and put it back in the box and it comes with everything you need to send it back. You send it back to the company, they run the soil test, and then they send you back the analysis of what your soil's like. Soil kit. It's called soilkit.com. <laughs> I think so. Soilkit.com? Yeah. We'll link it down below. And I don't know how it works exactly. Um, it's something I'm excited to try, but I think it's such a great option because, you know, otherwise you're either buying a kit at your garden center, which I think that those, again, are probably going to get you pretty close. Maybe they're not as thorough as a full on analysis. Um, and then the other place that's recommended to go is your local extension office, which to be honest with you, I didn't even know where ours was for most of my life. So to have an option that's really simple, like you just, it comes to you, you put your soil in it, you send it off and you're done. I think that's really neat, a neat way to do it. Sarah asked, how long do you wait before giving up on a plant like the Japanese maple? I planted one last year and it's just looking terrible this year, but it's such a big plant, I don't wanna have, have to let it go. And I'm probably not the best person to ask that because I don't give plants an awful long time to look good because I, get so much enjoyment out of my garden and I want things to perform and look awesome all the time that if it's just not hacking it, I will usually get rid of it. With something like that, and the reason I, you asked that is because I showed you my Japanese maple and how it's struggling this year. I will usually give it at least a full season. I'll fertilize it, I'll baby it, um, and then I'll let it come back the next year and see how it does. So, because sometimes they'll flush back brand new the next spring and look really good. I would think it would be fair to give your plant one or two full seasons after you know implementing some kind of new care regimen in terms of fertilizing and making sure that the water is consistent before making this a decision to pull something out especially on something big uh, peg said is that a tp for benjamin by the gazebo yes it is and i am planning on getting something planted on that this week i hope boy i am so behind this week like i have most of my big areas like right here in front of this sun porch you know we have the big flower beds that i usually plant up with annuals and i do have them planted up with pansies and tulips, the tulip leaves are still bright green. They're not even starting to die back yet and the pansies are full and gorgeous. And it just, I have a hard time pulling them out, but usually by now I have all of my annuals planted. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Diane said, do you cut the runners off the strawberries? And my gardener says that strawberries will take over a garden if you don't. And, and my gardener is correct. We will be cutting the runners off those strawberries for sure. I already have Japanese anemones in that bed and it is a chore to keep them contained. I think those run worse than strawberries. N Specter said, you seem so excited about everything. It's infectious and I really need that now. Hey, I wanna ask, did you cut back the blue fescue this season? I think I heard you talking about doing that earlier and they look more perky than in the past. They look great and they do look good this year and I do think it's because we actually cut them back. I don't know what my deal was, but we never cut them back before then. And Aaron, have you looked at them lately? I think you would like the look of them better. Really? I mean, you may not like the blue fescue just because I think you're set against it. He said against it right now, but I think um, they do look fresh and they look so much better than years past. Uh, red hot container arrangement is the next video. And in, in that one, I used a beautiful court and steel container from Gardner Supply. And I thought it would look really pretty planted up with warm colors because of the rust patina on that container. And I do really like how it turned out and I like where it's sitting in my vegetable garden right now. Carol said, I love the pot and the plants you chose to plant in it. Where will this one go? So in the vegetable garden, of course, I'm wondering if we'll be connected to drip. Well, hopefully, and I completely forgot, and a lot of you guys were asking about that. If I forgot to, if it was going to go somewhere else, or if I just forgot to put it on drip. And I just forgot to put it on drip. Some of them slipped through the cracks, but I will just go ahead. Since I've got that quarter inch black poly tubing, <clears throat> excuse me, I can come up behind the pot with that, and it'll kind of blend in with my black fence, and we'll make sure it's on drip. It just won't come up through the bottom. Carla said, just a question regarding the container. Does the metal heat up in the sun and cause stress to the plants? I've never had that happen. And I think that has more, more to do with consistent watering than anything else. Caroline said, after using the time release fertilizer, do you still do the weekly feed of water soluble? Yes, we absolutely do. And I feel like the continuous release for me 
is more of a backup plan. Like I know it's in the soil, which is really good for the plants. Um, and it's a really slow release while the weekly soluble is like hit them like quick with some nutrients. And these plants, they are big performing plants and they really are heavy feeders. And I feel like the more consistent you are with the fertilizing like that in that schedule has been really good for our containers. They've done really well in the past anyway with that sort of treatment. Chelsea said, May garden tour please. Yes, we really should do one of those, Erin, like this week, probably. Well, we have to if it's a May garden tour. We only have a few days left. Everything's looking pretty good and fresh and like the alliums are blooming beautifully still. We still have iris that are in bloom. Um, I've, had, I've got some of my areas swapped over to annuals. Some of them, like I said, are still in spring annuals, but it might be kind of a fun time to see it before everything like kind of explodes. Susan said, you mentioned that you wintered the calendula last year. Can you tell us how you decide what will winter in the greenhouse? Honestly, it depends on what kind of space I have and what mood I'm in in the fall. If I'm feeling extra like I want to save all these plants and see what I can do to winter them over, I will try to cram everything I can into the greenhouse, which is what we did last fall. If I'm feeling like, ah, if it survives outside, it survives. And if it doesn't, then I have an opportunity to plant something new. Sometimes I'm in that mood. So that's kind of how I decide. That's probably not helpful. Denise said, kicking myself for not buying tomato and pepper plants from Proven Winners, too many plants at the store. How do you know what to choose? I am also not great, a uh, great one to ask that question to because I can't choose. I have 30 some tomato plants in my greenhouse right now because I have a problem controlling myself. And with this new land out here, I just thought, well, I need stuff to fill up my cut flower garden space and I'll go ahead and plant all my tomatoes out there. So I've got um, a lot of them waiting. We're waiting for water still in the new property. And as soon as we have that, then it all have a late start on everything, which is totally fine. Our growing season is pretty long. I'll just be harvesting later than everybody else, but I'll get those all planted out. Amor said, Laura, do you not use coffee filters in the bottom of your pots anymore? I do, but it's typically only for containers like succulent arrangements or fairy gardens, like tabletop sort of things or inside plants are the only ones I use that on. I don't use them outside, like for my big pots. And Jessica said, have you noticed you've been using way more than the normal red blooms? I think you're broken. <laughs> Love to see the change and you pushing your boundaries. And the reason for this, I think this year is because I finally have a moon garden and I have an outlet for all of that energy that I have toward that sort of style, which I typically prefer. I like a softer color palette. I love the thought of doing the all white blooms with green foliage, a little bit of blue mixed in there as well. And I think that that's feeding me enough to where it's like allowing me or making me feel like I am interested in trying out other color palettes. And I think also having all of our containers along the fence line look cohesive and they're in my color palette, the, the color palette I love, I think that's so helpful because it makes me feel like the big parts of our property feel like they're more me. So when I come to con like a single container like this, I can go a little bit wild with color, wild for me anyway, um, and I am really enjoying it. I should have done a moon garden a long time ago, Erin. You would have got your red blooms a lot sooner. Next video was a shade container inspiration. I planted up a beautiful fern with some impatience, coleus, and ivy. Ron asked, I always get confused about the fertilizer. Sometimes you add biotone, sometimes you add that slow release fertilizer. Can you elaborate on when to use each? You could use either one. I've had really good luck with both of them. They're both slow release fertilizers. And really, I've been wanting to uh, try out a lot more biotone in my flower containers specifically, just to see what kind of results I will get. Um, so I've been using both. I used um, the slow release on some of my containers, the proven winners, and then the biotone on others. So it'll be an interesting year just to see how things shake out. Next question, when you winter over that fern plant, what does that mean? Keep it inside over the winter or could it be kept in a garage? When I winter things over, it might mean that they're wintering over in our cold frame. Um, and if I have things that are slightly higher zone than we are, oftentimes I can get away with, like the calendula is a zone seven and we are a zone, now a zone six, but I put them in the cold frame and they wintered beautifully, bloomed all winter long in there. Sometimes I winter things over in containers outside. And usually if you're going to do that, you wanna choose plants that are rated two zones colder than your growing zone. So if you live somewhere that's a zone six, for example, you wanna choose something that's rated at a zone four. That way you've got like a 20 degree buffer zone and it just helps your plant thrive through a winter if you have an especially cold one. Um, you can winter things over in a garage. Keep in mind if they're evergreens, they still need light. Um, and then also keep in mind if it's something like a perennial or like the fern, you know, will die back, it still needs to have moisture. So it's not so important that it has light, but it still needs to have consistent moisture. You don't wanna let anything dry out completely. 
And Yang Sun said, what did you plant with your Japanese maple this year? And it, there have been the same things in that container since day one. So I planted the Japanese maple surrounded by uh, wee hostas and black mondo grass. And that's what comes back in that container every single year. So I haven't touched it in a couple of years. Mary said, love how the container turned out, but I was totally distracted by the kneeling pad. Is that two pads stacked on top of each other or one really cushy one? I think that was two stacked on top of each other. <laughs> it's because one of them is like, well, both of them are getting kind of broken down. We go through them quick around here. Um, I miss my Tommy Co kneeling pad so much. It was like a gel kind of one and it was really big and it flew out of the back of our truck one day after we did a project, I think at his parents' house and I couldn't find it. And anyway, they don't make it anymore. So I've been using the foam ones. There is one called, I don't know, it's a really big thick one. And I need to go down to the garden center and pick up a couple more of those because it's like two kneeling pads stacked on top of each other, but it's one. That's the best one. I'll try to find a link and link it down below. Uh, Nancy said, can Benjamin ride a big wheel or any toy like that on the gravel? The gravel is incredibly hard to move around on. I mean, as you can imagine, even me, like my mom and I have bikes here um, and she'll come and we'll ride our bikes down to the coffee shop or something like that. And the bikes are hard and there's some areas in our driveway that are really deep with gravel. So a lot of times I just walk my bike to where the pavement starts. Aaron wants to pave our driveway really, really bad. And on one hand, I think it would be nice um, for Benjamin. He would be able to ride around on his toys and all of that. Um, I am a little resistant or reluctant because I do like the look of gravel. I think it looks soft. I think it's really pr a pretty look when it's maintained. Um, and I don't know, I feel like pavement has a, a propensity to make things look more commercial. And I don't, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Aaron may get his way. Uh, Cindy Bet says, what is the name of the tree behind you? That is a weeping willow. Ellen said, are you not allowed to name any other garden grower except proven winners? Monrovia grows great plants. They do grow great plants. And no, I can talk about or show whatever plants I want. And that's why I use the ostrich fern from uh, Monrovia in this arrangement because I thought it would look so pretty and I do think it turned out beautiful. I don't think I would actually ever work with a company that wanted to pigeonhole me or like kind of force me to only use their things. It's just that like clearly we work with proven winners a lot. I deeply respect their company and I do think their plants are really good. Um, and I've been using them long before we ever started a YouTube channel. I've had quite a bit of experience with especially the annuals um, from down at the garden center and doing city projects and planting them in my own garden. Um, so I tend to lean toward the, those plants anyway because they do really well traditionally in our area. Annette said, so if you were leaving the fern and ivy to winter over and the next season just pop in a few annuals again, how do you treat the soil to prepare for the new season with plants already in the planter? What I like to do is scrape off any loose soil that's on the top. So anything that will come up like a couple inches down or so, I will scrape that off. I'll add in some biotone starter fertilizer, just kind of scratch that in, and then I'll add fresh potting soil. It's not a whole lot of potting soil, but it's just a little bit of a fresh start and then you can recharge your soil with the biotone. Anna said, can you please do an outdoor succulent arrangement? Coming this week, I think, if we get to the project. I'm really excited about it. Next video was planting out perennials I grew from seed. Christine said, thanks for the mini tour and for sharing your garden and work processes. Did you harden off the plants between taking them out of the greenhouse and planting them? Um, you know what, I didn't, and I think the difference here is I always refer to our greenhouse as a greenhouse when it's not a greenhouse, it's a cold frame. Greenhouses are things that are heated um, and they're a lot, a lot more like climate controlled. A cold frame is just like a plastic bubble sitting up off the ground and it does keep things warmer in there um, and it keeps like strong winds off of things. But these foxgloves and perennials that I've, I've had out there have been out there for weeks now. I did start them from seed inside and when they got big enough, I bumped them up in pot size and moved them out there. And they've gone through nights in the upper 20s which in there, you know, they're probably above freezing, but still pretty darn cold. And then I leave the doors open too in the front and back. So airflow really does get through there pretty good. Um, you don't want, you do want to harden off your seedlings though. If you've got things that you're moving from inside to outside, it's super important to just start with a small window of time where they're outside, not in direct sun um, and protect it a little bit from any kind of strong wind and then gradually increase that amount of time over the course of a few days and then maybe bump them out into a little bit more and more light so that you're not shocking the plant. Because if it's going straight from inside to outside in a direct sunspot where it's getting like a lot of wind, that can kill your seedlings off super, super quickly. So that hardening off process is really important. With these, since they have been out for so long and they were such established plants, it didn't matter quite as much. Plus we're really warm now. All the nights I think are in the 50s. We're getting up to 100 this week. so. I don't think anything's gonna really skip a beat. 
being planted out. Uh, Nurse Lucy said, can you do a video about what gypsum looks like and how you add it? Um, so gypsum you can get in a couple of different uh, forms, I guess. I don't know if you can get it. Can you get liquid gypsum? Is that a thing? I don't think so. You can get powder. Powder. Powder or granulated. We use a lot of granulated gypsum because it's much easier to put through a broadcast spreader if you're adding it to your grass, which we do. Um, and then granulated is also easier to like scoop up out of a bag and put into the, you know your flower beds as you're planting things. On this new land, I imagine we'll be getting powdered gypsum to be added in. It's just broken down further. Um, so it may be quicker acting. I'm not sure about that, but um, powdered gypsum though, never put that in a broadcast spreader and try to spread that around because I've done it before and it clogs everything up and makes a huge mess out of everything. But it's white, usually like the powdered gypsum looks white. The granular granules look kind of like a light gray color. Anyway. Yes, we will do a video. Yes, we will do a video. <laughs> uh, a Olson says, is there any soil that you shouldn't add gypsum to? I uh, don't know if there is any that I know of that you shouldn't add gypsum to. I mean, I don't think it's always necessary. In our case, we're using it to help break up the soil because we've got a really kind of hard pan out in our new property and our, our soil pH is really high and it does help condition the soil and bring the pH down a bit. Um, so that's why we use it. But if you've got nice soil and you don't have, you know, the issues we do, you may not need to even bother with it. Kathy Wright says, bed and breakfast question. Have you thought of having a bed and breakfast on your new property? That would be so awesome and revenue for you guys. Um, you know what? It's something, I mean, we've talked about it. It's a, it's a fun thing to talk about and think about. I know that the previous owners of our home, our friends, have always been interested in that idea. And this home, like the one we're currently this home we're living in would be kind of ideal, I guess, for that. We'd have to reconfigure some stuff inside, but not while we're living here. Like, I think at this point, it would be a little bit of a safety concern. I mean, with the size of our channel now and like inviting people into our home to stay uh, might be a little bit, I don't know, like maybe if we decided to keep this location, but move like Aaron and I have been looking at other properties around our area lately. Uh, and if we decided to move somewhere else and keep this and like run it as a B&B, &B, I just don't know if it would ever be financially feasible though. Like maybe I think doing tours, like large groups of people coming in might make it a little bit fi more financially feasible. I just don't know if like just having a few people staying the nights, I don't know if, I don't know what rates are. I don't know any of that stuff. Um, at this point, I mean, it's a fun thing to think about. I mean, we talk about business possibilities all the time. Aaron is big about that. He would talk about it 24 seven if I would, wouldn't get like so. Anyway, yeah, it's definitely fun to dream about. Not something we'll probably do while we're living here. Uh, Veronica said, this is the last question on this video. I love how excited you get. My non-gardening friends just can't understand. It's like seeing a long lost friend. Yes. Yes, I'm like you guys are my people. People who get excited about plants and gardening and projects. Like it's so fun. This whole like the whole community that has been created here is such a positive, fun, encouraging place and I draw a lot of energy just from seeing you guys excited about stuff and seeing pictures that you share with me and projects you're working on. It's all it's a mutually beneficial relationship, trust me. And the last video this week a uh, colorful container arrangement for a full sunspot. So I just planted up my urns in front of our arbor up here, the Savannah urns from Unique Stone. They're gorgeous, um, the urns are. And I think the plants are gonna be really pretty too. Natalie said, this may sound like a, a silly question, but is there an expiration date or any rule of thumb in regards to how long you can store bag soil for? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think you could, Unless like your bag is full of holes and like getting wet and stuff like that. I mean, you could breed some sort of fungus gnat issue if you know, you're know you not storing it properly, but I don't think there is an expiration date on soil. Uh, Katie said, why are some salvia annual and some perennial? I thought they were all perennial until I heard about these playing the blues. What are the differences you see? Well, the annual salvias perform all season long. So playing the blues, um, rockin' blue suede shoes, the fuchsia, um, there's a couple other varieties. They all get bigger than the um, perennial type. They a lot of times have bigger blooms and then they bloom all season long. Um, and I think that they're perennial somewhere. I mean, they're what, like zone maybe nine, wow. 10, 11, something like that. Anyway, anyway, the other perennial salvias usually have two blooms in them a season. Like they'll have two bloom times. So like right now my salvias are blooming. Probably a couple weeks we'll be shearing them back and then they'll bloom again later on, like late summer, early fall. Um, so you don't get quite as spectacular of a show out of the perennials, but they do come back every year. So there's the pros and cons 
um, between the two. I like to have both in my garden. Both of them are honeybee and pollinator attractors big time though. Marty said, will the cannas bloom all summer? Mine only bloom for about a month. Yes, the toucan cannas I've noticed, I've grown, well, the toucan red last year in one of my containers, or I think it's scarlet or red or something like that. And then there's one other variety, I did the yellow. Um, and then this year the toucan coral and mine have bloomed all season long. I just make sure to keep them deadheaded and they look really good all the time. Helen said, is there a ready-made BT product I can use on my petunias? I'd sure love it if there is. You know, um, you can use spinosad based product like the Captain Jack's dead bug. That's what Bonide will tell you to use for budworms um, other than rather than BT. Uh, and I kind of went over this, I think, in my video. Well, did I go over this in a video recently? But the reason I like to use BT is that it's a very um, uh, targeted insecticide in that it only kills the budworm caterpillars. It doesn't affect any honeybees or any other beneficials that might be out. And the Captain Jack's dead bug is a great one, but you just have to be a little bit more careful about when you spray it. You want to make sure you spray it like at dusk or really early in the morning before you've got a lot of activity on your plants uh, in terms of other insects. So last question is a repeat. I accidentally put it in there twice, so we are done for today. We did put up our video about the new property. We did an update and then I planted sweet peas. We just put that up this morning, so I think I'm gonna let that one run a little while um, so that those of you guys who have questions have time to get them in and then I'll pull questions from that for next week's recap video. Anyway, hope this was helpful to you guys and let me know if you guys like this type of video. I mean, just because since we're in the mode of kind of like switching it over to highlights and then maybe retooling the video, I'd love to know your thoughts on if these videos are helpful for you um, and so forth. So anyway, hope you guys all have a really great week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.